Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, May 27th, 2010. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. Well, this week, Kai Troister joins us to talk about one of his favorite subjects, decoction. Decoction mashing is an advanced and somewhat controversial brewing technique steeped in tradition. We get Kai's take on the topic, and I get to do a taste test to see if I can detect the difference decoction makes. Well, if you're new to home brewing and would like to get into the hobby for the first time, check out our website, basicbrewing.com, where you can find archives of our audio and video podcasts and our DVDs to walk you through basic and more advanced brewing techniques. And you can follow me on Twitter. I'm Basic Brewing, all one word. You can find me on Facebook at facebook.com slash basicbrewing.james. Our show page is at facebook.com slash basicbrewing. And uh, thanks to everybody clicking on the Amazon.com associate link on our basicbrewing.com site. Whenever you think of Amazon, think of us and click on our associate link first. It won't cost you any extra, and you'll be helping us to bring you this show. And we appreciate your support greatly. We also have associate links for Brew Your Own Magazine and the American Homebrewers Association on our site, too. And I know that they appreciate your support as well. And you can find our Basic Brewing iPhone app on the iTunes store. Uh, Kai and I talked for a good long time, but I want to mention one very quick legislative update before we get into the interview. I got a note from Mike Neely of the Malt Munching Mash Monsters down in Louisiana, There's a bill working its way through the state legislature down there that will allow the serving of homebrew at establishments that are licensed to sell alcohol already. Um, This will enable homebrewers to have club meetings, competitions, and uh, other events in bars, restaurants, and other establishments, uh, like I say, that are are already licensed to serve alcohol. Uh, Mike says uh, HB 1484 passed the Louisiana House with 84 yeas, and three nays, and has been referred to the Senate. So that's outstanding. Uh, it will go to one of three Senate Judiciary Committees, but we don't know which one yet. Mike says, we are pleased so far, and if passed, the Louisiana law regarding homebrew will be very favorable. Well, that is awesome, and it sounds like with 84 to 3, it sounds like they're on the road to getting that law passed. So good news from Louisiana, and I appreciate Mike passing along that update. By the time that you hear this, the uh, Basic Brewing Radio BYO Experiment uh, form will be out there on basicbrewing.com slash experiment. So uh, you'll be able to record your results from the, uh, the Irish Moss Experiment, which is very exciting. Well, before we launch into the interview with Kai, I want to point out that uh, Kai will be a presenter at the National Homebrewers Conference coming up June 17th through 19th in Minneapolis. Kai will be giving a presentation on efficiency on Saturday morning at 9 o'clock. So check him out then. Well, Kai Troister, welcome back to Basic Brewing Radio. Well, thanks for having me uh, on the show again. It has been a while since since I've been on your show last, I think. Yeah, yeah. I've missed you. (laughs) (laughs) I've I've been busy. (laughs) Well, uh, hopefully we can make up for lost time. Uh, tonight, we're, so we're going to talk about decoction. And I was looking up into the uh, searching the RSS feed of Basic Brewing Radio, and I look and and we talked to Chris Colby originally about decoction back in November of 2006. So uh, it's been a while, and it's probably uh, probably worth another discussion, don't you think? Yeah, and it's also one of my most favorite uh, brewing hobbies, uh, not brewing hobbies, br- brewing topics, because, I mean, what 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 is more um, German than decoction and lager brewing? <laughs> <laughs> so I've been doing a lot of reading about decoction. I've been following uh, some of the discussions that, uh, that, that brewers generally have on the topic. So I hope I can add an, uh, a lot of new information to the discussion. Now I, I have to ask you, and, I, and I'm throwing you, uh, I'm throwing you a wild uh, pitch here, and I hope you, do, I hope you don't mind. But uh, you, you brought up the the, the German brewing. Uh, I'm sure you've heard me discuss my Reinheitsgebot is a four letter word shirts. <laughs> yes, I have. Actually, I did have to ask my wife, what is so funny about is a four letter word? <laughs> so yes, I. <laughs> 
So, so do you take that in the in the proper spirit that it's intended? Do you are you offended by that, or do you take it in a in a good way? Well, I think just the Reinhardsgebot goes with German brewing, and German brewing wouldn't be what it is without the Reinhardsgebot. It's it's a great it's a great way to to set rules. I think so that everybody has to adhere to a certain rules and that. Especially technology, uh, brewing um, technology has to find creative ways to get around these rules or, stay, or basically stay within these bounds. Now that, of course, means that they are, we can't or the Germans can't really brew all beer styles that are out there, but they are not really trying to do that either. Right, right. So, you, so, so you're not offended. Uh, no, I'm, I'm not offended. Just, okay. <laughs> I am a believer in the the idea of the Reinheitsgebot. Well, I, as I said, you know, on the show before, if you, if you want to follow the Reinheitsgebot, if you choose to follow the Reinheitsgebot, I think that that's a wonderful thing. Uh, you know, sometimes it's good to follow certain rules and to uh, put some boundaries on yourself. Actually, not to make it a Reinheitsgebot discussion. I mean, that, that, that would be a topic for a whole other and another show, it is actually not as straightforward as just uh, is it, uh, malt, water, uh, hops, and yeast. So there are, there, there's a lot of tricky things about what's allowed in the Reinhardtsko board and what is not. And even I haven't really figured it out. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe that's maybe that's a topic for another discussion. Maybe we should try to figure out the Reinhardtsko board and see. Uh, <laughs> You know, see if anybody's following it or not. Uh, <laughs> well, they they have to by by law. So 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 I know that German brewers are for, are following it. Well, there you go. Well, as I say, that's kind of a wild pitch there, and I appreciate you taking that. No uh, problem. But we're we're ta- here to talk about decoction, and you uh, you actually sent me some beers, which I'm extremely excited about. Uh, yes. It, one is labeled A, and the other is labeled B. And while you uh, while you start the discussion and tell us what decoction is, uh, I'm going to open these beers and I'm going to pour some samples and and let them get warming up. So so take it away, Kai. What is decoction? So decoction mashing is a form of step mashing where the temperature rests or the different temperature rests are achieved by separating the mash into a decoction and the main mash or the remaining mash. And that decoction part is then heated and brought to a boil. And possibly that that heating is done with rests. And these days, actually, many breweries don't even boil the decoction anymore, I I recently learned. It's just sufficient to bring the decoction to just to boiling temperatures and hold it there for the duration of the the decoction boil time, so, so to speak. And once that boil is over, the decoction is returned to the main mash and where it then raises the temperature of the mash. And other than, or in contrast to just infusion mashing, decoction mashing is a mashing procedure where there are not only fit, uh, biochemical processes, uh, so the enzyme re- reactions, work on the starches, but there also is the physical process of of boiling, which helps the starch break down by liberating more starch, especially it can liberate starch granules that are still embedded in a protein ma- matrix or still embedded in a cell, um, cell ball structure. And the decoction is able to just burst these um, starch gran- granules open and thus make it more easy for the enzymes to access them. And in the coction mashing, since the focus is more on on degrading the starch by using these decoctions and then the enzymes th- that are left, the focus is less on extended rests as it is, uh, for example, in infusion mashing, where the mash just relies, uh, relies on the on the power of the enzymes to break down uh, the starches. I guess when thinking about the word decoction, is it the opposite of concoction? When you have when you make a concoction, you're putting things together. Like when you make a you know a cocktail, a concoction, you're putting things together to 
to make something. And with decoction, are you destructing it at first to then put it back together? Is that what that means? I have never thought about that. Actually, in, in German, um, the word decoction or decoctionsverfahren, which is the name for the German word for decoction mesh, is not used as as often as they would use uh, this, the word Kochmeisch for fun, which is the means boiling mash procedure. Hmm. So yeah, I've, I've not thought about the thing with uh, decoction and concoction. Maybe I'm just making that up. <laughs> 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 Maybe that's my own little way of remembering that word, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so it sounds like you finish those beers pretty quickly. Yeah. Right? <laughs> no, my, my mind thinks that randomly uh, without uh, influence of uh, any help. Uh, so, so how did they come up with this? I mean, uh, this this goes back a ways, doesn't it? Yes, this goes back to um, German brewing, uh, in especially in Bavaria and Bohemia, which is now the uh, Czech Republic where they figured out that boiling and returning measured amounts of mash allowed for much more consistent rests without the use of thermometers. And this boiling process also made the starches more accessible, which is important for poorly or unevenly modified malts. And it also has a better better glucan uh, reduction because of the low temperature rests and the decoction parts. So what that allowed is actually to brew high quality beers from the suboptimal malt that they had back in those days. And the standard mash from which basically all decoction mashes are derived from and even from which the uh, in the modern infusion mashes are, the, are derived from is the uh, triple decoction where there are many variations, and I think we, are, we even talked about uh, one, one example from the German brewing book that I uh, read a while back and where we had a show about. But let's, this example here that, that I want, want to talk about has a dough in at about 35 to 37 degrees Celsius, so that's between uh, 9, 95 and 99 degrees Fahrenheit. And after the dough in, dough in the mash is continuously mixed and held there at this temperature for about 30 minutes, which allows the malt to hydrate and which allows, or most, oh, most importantly, which allows the enzymes to be dissolved into the mash liquid. And after that, the one third of thick mash is pulled from that into a, another mash vessel, a heatable mash vessel, and brought to boiling there. And what they would do is, especially now they, they do that when they have um, mash agitators, they would stop the agitator and let the mash settle. And then with the agitator running at slow speed, they would just pump the thick uh, part of the mash into the, um, into the mash kettle. So that, there it is heated and brought to a boil and might be boiled for um, 10 minutes for a, for a lighter beer or up to even 45 minutes for dark beers. And once that is over, that, that boil, the main mash is returned, uh, the, I'm sorry, the decoction is returned to the main mash. And that may take from 10 to, to 20 minutes because other than in home brewing, that we'll talk about later, they can't just dump the uh, <laughs> mash kettle into the uh, in, into the mash tun. So it takes its time, which is good too, because the enzymes are not shocked mm -hmm. uh, at that point. They are just slowly then br brought up to the next rest temperature, which would be between fifty and fifty three degrees Celsius, so one hundred twenty two to one hundred twenty eight degrees Fahrenheit. Again, at this temperature, the mash is rested for only, let's say, 15 minutes. And then another thick decoction is pulled. It's brought to, boil, to a boil or nowadays just heated to near boiling temperatures. And then boiled there for 30 minutes and returned to the main mash to reach, to reach a sacrification temperature 
between uh, 62 and 67 degrees Celsius or 144 to 154 Fahrenheit. So where it sits again for about 15 minutes until a thin decoction is pulled and that decoction is pulled from, from the top of the mash. That decoction is then quickly heated to a boil, brought to a uh, boil for, for 20 minutes and returned to the main mash for to reach the mash out temperature of about 75 degrees Celsius or 167 degrees Fahrenheit. And at that point, the louder process starts. And the whole mash process takes anywhere from four to six hours, depending on how long the boil times were. Now, I have a couple of questions. Uh, on the third decoction, why would that be thinner than the others? Right. The third decoction is pulled thin to make sure that the amount of starches that are liberated during the boil are minimized. Because once it is returned to, to the main mesh, there is still enzyme activity, but that, enzyme, but that enzymatic activity is, fa is fairly weak. And if too many starches are liberated during the boil, then uh, there may be unconverted starches or large, very large dextrins that uh, get into the word and then into the final beer. Hmm. And another question: When we do uh, when we do steeping for an extract beer yes. with specialty grains, we're yes. to we're told remove the grain bag at 170 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, uh, which would be around 75 Celsius, yes. uh, because you know above that point you start to extract tannins. From the grain. Now, yeah. here we're telling yeah. people to take the grain, uh, you know, along with the the some wort in the mash, and boil it for an extended yeah. period of time. Now, why? What's the difference? There's not much difference, except that there is a pH difference. But uh, which? So let's go about talk about tannin extraction. It's fact that the cocktail mashing produces more tannins in the wort. Than, in, than infusion ma ma mashing does. It's just the fact that, yes, you boil the grain, and so you extract more, more tannins. And it is also considered a part of the, the character of a decoction beer, because it makes this, the increased tannin ex extraction makes it more robust tasting. Hmm. However, it's not, I'm not talking about excessive tannin extraction that would cause a puckering in, in your mouth. It is because of the pH, which is fairly low, it's pretty much mash pH. Because of that, the tannin extraction is not as excessive as it would be, for example, if you steep uh, a bag of, um, let's say, a bag of specialty malts in a large amount of water where it may not settle mm -hmm. at the uh, same temperature. Now, I actually, or oh, where the pH may, may not settle at, at like an equivalent mash pH or a safe pH. And I, I have to say that actually I got into home brewing uh, starting out with Elton Brown's uh, recipe, mm -hmm. which calls for boiling the grain. Right. Or it, doesn't, or it doesn't call for taking the grain out, whichever way. It doesn't call for <laughs> taking the grain out. And, yes. and I don't remember that beer actually being overly astringent. And there was also a... Um, a member of, of a few home brewing boards, and he did a an experiment where he just boiled the grain and 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 then and then loudered it, and he didn't he didn't report that the beers were astringent. Huh. Uh, he did report, however, that the beers uh, were cloudy, and I believe that is because of starch haze. So what 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 happens if if you heat grain beyond let's say these 170 de um, de degree Fahrenheit, well, you actually start liberating more, more starch. So there, there's always some, some starch tucked away in some corner, some, unmod some unmodified corner of the malt um, kernels. But at that temperature, you already denature the enzymes. So you liberate starch and no enzymes to convert it into sugars so that our starch makes it into the wort which is why we are actually told not to exceed 170 degrees in mashing or loudering. Well, there you go. 
That makes sense. There, since there's no uh, there's no mashing going on, there's no conversion going on. Those starches that are liberated don't get converted, so they yes. stick around. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Uh, so so back to the history. We we don't uh, you don't so much see decoction uh, as a necessity anymore. And why is no, that? No, you don't. Basically, the subsequent improvements in malt quality allowed for higher dough in temperatures and also allowed for brewing without decoctions. And then with that came just the modern uh, brew houses, which <clears throat> where there are energy concerns. Although actually the decoction mashing does not really take more energy unless the, ma the mash is boiled because all the energy you use to heat the decoction, you will use to actually then heat the main mash by returning the decoction to, to the main mash. Uh, the decoctions also require that you have two mash vessels, uh, one of which has to be heated. These days, most, mo uh, most of the time, both mash, mash vessels are heated. Uh, but what's the bigger factor in why the decoction mashing is used less and less is that a modern high-efficiency brew house tries to do as many as 12 batches per day. So that means at each stage, a batch can only spend up to two hours. Mm -hmm. So they have to cut down on the, um, on the mash time. And the coctions just naturally take a longer time because of the heating, which takes a while, and then of the boiling of the decoction. Right. But especially in southern Germany, you'll find a lot of small and medium-sized breweries that still still use it. And I'm now from uh, visiting Paulana, the, the Paulana brewery, that they use it on a lot of their beers, including their, their Helles and Eyinger, for example, which is the German equivalent of, of a microbrewery. Mm -hmm. uh, they, you, they, they, they use it as well on many of their beers. For example, they, uh, their double bock is um, brewed with a triple decoction mash. Huh. So, and from reading books, I also read that, yes, that especially in dark beers, it's expected that, or many brewers are expected to use uh, decoctions. And it's just that, 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 that there might be a flavor benefit to that, but it's also that German brewers are just, very much steeped in tradition and the cocktail mashing, ma mashing is is a big part of that tra tradition mm -hmm. now what what am i drinking here what 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 is where are the a and b beers so let let me just actually get my uh beer set, set up here i haven't done that yet okay <laughs> we will <laughs> pause we will put this is the pause that refreshes so what, what I sent you uh, are two versions of the Maibach that I brewed for this season. And one of them obviously has been brewed with a decoction mash. And the, and the other one has been brewed with an equivalent stepped infusion mash. Ah. So both have the same uh, rest temperatures? Uh, yes, they have the same rest temperatures and... It's difficult to con to convert times, but they have about the same uh, attenuation potential. So they're both at about eighty percent, and there's and they also have the same um, final atten attenuation. Now we talked about what's going on with the decoction itself, as you're taking it out of the mash tun and you're and you're you're resting it at certain temperatures, you're bringing it up to heat, you're boiling it, you're putting it back in, but there's th in the mash tun itself, in the main mash, there uh, are rests going on at those temperatures. Yes. Uh, so things are still going on in the main mash yes. at the same time that the decoction is working. Yeah. And, and, and that's intended something you may have to factor into uh, if you want to convert between an infusion mash and a decoction mash where you want to, say, try to get the same uh, word fermentability. So that in the main mesh, there is still a breakdown of starches and there is still a breakdown of, of proteins, uh, something I, I want to touch on later uh, regarding con concerns that people may have. So how did you do the, uh, the non-decoction batch? How did you kind of replicate the, the rest temperatures 
uh, on that one? So the non-decoction batch just used standard Hochkot smash. This is something we talked about in the German brewing practices um, show where you go in at about 63 degrees Celsius, so 104, 145, and then you hold that mash for a time, in my case, uh, for 45 minutes before it is then heated to about 160 degree uh, Fahrenheit or 70 degrees Celsius, at which temperature it sits for another hour. Hmm. And then it, it is heated again to get to the mash out temperature of 75 degrees Celsius or 170 degree Fahrenheit. So is this a double decoction then? That is, uh, yes, that would then be a double decoction okay. that I made out of it for the uh, other beer. Boy, they, I'm telling you, these are, it's pretty close. I mean, my my palate, as I've somewhat proved on the show, although I got lucky last time with the tasting, uh, <laughs> it, it can be as dull as a hammer. So uh, I'm I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna withhold my comments, my my judgments until later on in the discussion. Maybe you know I'll have an epiphany between now and the end of our uh, chat. But uh, what so what are the uh, uh, effects on on beer flavor and quality? I mean, why if you wanted to do a triple decoction and spend you know a long brew day, which can be an enjoyable experience, uh, but why would you want to go to that work? Well, if you if you taste the decoction, the cocked and non-decocted beers, you will actually find that there's a surprisingly small taste difference in them. And my belief is that if you're just going to do it for taste, you first have to brew a, a lot of side-by-side -side batches <laughs> to actually try to hone your palate to find the difference. Ah. And um, so I, I have done a few side-by-side um, -side batches uh, with respect to the cocktail, and with some of them, yes, I was able to find a flavor difference that I would contribute to the decoction. With some of them, I actually have not really found a difference, and they look taste very similar. Well, I feel to, to I feel better I feel better then because the the difference between these two beers is very very subtle. And I'm trying to I'm trying to pick out little notes that I can can pick on, but 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 don't let me slow you down, Kai. I'm... No, that's, so <laughs> so what's the cocktail mashing does? It does extract more husk compounds. So the decocted beer tends to be slightly more robust tasting, and that works well for darker beers. Now there is no excess, or there should not be excessive tannin extraction, but there is some tannin extraction, and thus the cocktail is not so much suited for a more delicate beer, like, for example, a German Pilsner. Again, for example, in German brewing, um, brew brewers may even go out of their, their way and separate the husks from the grits and flour and add the husks later to the mash just to minimize the tannin extraction. Huh. But there are not many that do that, and that's a, that um, I know that Truma does it. Um, it's not it's not a German, German brewer, but they call it endosperm mashing. And uh, I know that there are one or two brewers in Germany who still do that as well. But also in the decocted beer, you have increased me melanoidin production in the decoction, and it's particularly in dark beers where there are already a lot of precursors coming in with the malt. There is increased protein co coagulation during the mash, so you will get less troop at the end. Uh, the cocktail mashing leads to a better, better glucan degradation, because in the cocktail mashing, the, the better glucans can be made soluble, which actually happens at a higher temperature um, as their degradation because of the enzymes that are involved, actually the, the beta glucan solubilase, which is the enzyme that, that makes them soluble, works around uh, 60 degree uh, Celsius, which is 140 degree Fahrenheit. And the beta glucanase, which is the enzyme that actually breaks them down uh, once they are soluble, 
that actually is already denatured once you get to 50 degrees Celsius or around 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Mm. One thing, one thing that you you do when you when you do take portions of the mash away and you boil it is you are you are denaturing hunks of the enzyme you know population of the mash at a time. Yes, you do. But there should be enough left over in the main mash to do the the body of the work. Okay. Yes, you get more en- enzymes in the main mash, and that you can actually enhance by making sure that you use a thin mash so that you have more liquid in the main mash, which uh, contains these enzymes. And uh, another thing that you can do is as you heat the decoction, you can actually rest the decoction at a um, conversion temperature, for example, 160 degree Fahrenheit or 70 degree Celsius works well to utilize a lot of the enzymes that you will be denaturing soon. So how do we bring this – I mean, we talked about pretty much decoction at a, at a commercial scale and in a historical perspective. But how do we bring this home? I mean, how do we do decoction successfully in our own home breweries? Because these – by the way, both of these beers are delicious. So, oh, thanks. <laughs> they are wonder. I'm enjoying trying to pick out the little you know nuances because I get to drink more of them as I am trying to do that. So, uh, I'll get back to work with doing that. Tell us, <laughs> lead us into uh, how we can bring this method home. Well, in in home brewing, the cocktail is apparently rather controversial, and it does have a lot to do with with yeah the the amount of work for the apparent little gain. That, that you get get a flavor difference. I mean, really, if you're after brewing a lot of beer and you want to optimize the time that you spend on each beer, well, then the cocktail mashing is not really for, for you and just infusion mashing uh, should work. But I do en- encourage brewers to see for, for themselves and brew side-by-side experiments. And it's also part of the hobby is not only the destination, in our um, um no it, it's not only the destination in our hobby but that's the way we we get there and it's just a lot of people just enjoy just working on ma- really making a beer by boiling mash and having this connection so to speak to a tra- to the traditional brewing i agree i mean if we if we really uh didn't like the process we would just go down to the liquor store or the grocery store and buy some beer. But the fact that we're taking the time to do the process at all is an indication that we like to to do it. Exactly. Uh, so, you know, decoction is just another extension of that. And and I do use it for um, all my Bach beers and other seasonal beers. And I'm also with the decoction mash that I choose, I'm fairly mindful of the type of malt that that I'm using. But let's talk about um, the practical decoction mashing at home. So you want to start with a fairly thin mash, so three to four liters per kilogram or one and a half to two quarts per pound is a good start. And if your mash tan doesn't hold more, if you have to go to a thicker mash because, because your mash tan, well, then that's your limitation and you will have to go with that. With respect to mash pH, if you control that, you should aim for a pH that is greater than 5.4. Now, the problem is with the cocktail, it does lower the, the, the pH by about 0.1 to 0.2 units. And if you start out too low with your pH, it can happen that the cocktail kind of puts, it gets that pH even lower, and then the enzymes are not at their, especially the, the amylase enzymes are not at their optimum anymore. Hmm. And you do denature a lot, a lot of enzymes, and for example, the dark malts, you don't have a lot of enzymes to start with. So you do want to be closer to the to the optimum of the alpha amylase, which is around five point six to five point eight. To determine the decoction volume, just use the simple formula where you where the ratio between the decoction volume and the main mash volume is the same as the ratio between the target temperature and current mash temperature difference and the boiling temperature and current mash temperature difference. 
So you just can just go, don't try to remember this formula. Just go to a decoction volume cal calculator that you can find on the internet. Calculate your decoction volume and then add about 10 to 20% to that volume. Hmm. And I'll, talk, I'll mention later why that is good to add actually uh, about 20%. Now, once your mash has rested and you want to pull the decoction, just pull a thick decoction by scooping out the grain from the bottom. Or what I do is actually I, I use a strainer to scoop out grain and add back liquid until I have about uh, one to one and a quarter quarts per pound, pound as, mass, as the decoction thickness. So I have a 14 liter en enamel pot and notched my mash paddle to be able to measure volumes in that pot. So that's how I figure out how big my, my decoction is. And don't make the decoctions too thick. Uh, you will regret that later. So the the suggestion that a lot of brewers have where uh, the decoction has to be as thick as possible and it's just the water, the grain has to be above the uh, word surface. Uh, don't really follow that because that means that you will have to do much more, much more work later. And just remember how breweries pull the cocktions. They just turn off the agitators and letting the grain settle, and then that is the, the, the decoction thickness. So now that you have pulled the decoction, start heating the decoction and stir it until it reaches about 70 to 75 degrees Celsius, or 160 to 170 degrees Fahrenheit, and hold it there for 10 to 20 minutes. And that step is not really necessary, especially if you have lighter malts, so malts that are very rich in enzymes. But what that rest does, it converts most of the starch in the decoction and thus utilizes the enzymes that will soon be, de be denatured. And more importantly, it makes the decoction more liquid. Mm -hmm. So once you're done with that step, it's much easier to stir the decoction and it will not uh, scorch as easily. Then at that point, just continue to heat the mash with a gentle heat. And I just... Don't don't stir don't stir much at that point because I don't really have to worry that I denature enzymes uh, too quickly. So I just let it heat heat up slowly. I'll, I'll keep the lid on the pot so I don't need as much heat. And once I reach a boil, I just lower the heat until I get a bit more than than a simmer when the lid is on. And by doing so, I rarely have to stir the mash. Uh, occasionally, I'll I'll check on it and. And I'll turn it around a bit with with the, with the mash paddle, and then I just boil it for fifteen to even forty five minutes, depending on the type, the type of beer. So you don't and, worry too much about scorching at that point. Well, because for for one, you're you're not really looking for a vigorous boil. I mean, I said before that many breweries just heat the uh, decoction to boiling temperatures without actually bringing it to a boil. And all of the reactions that, that we look for in a decoction, they are accomplished without having a boil. So the high temperature will cause the starches to, gel to gelatinize. The high temperatures will cause the tannin extraction that makes the beer more robust tasting. And the higher temperatures will also cause the melanoidin Re reactions. Hmm. A vigorous ball is not needed because you're not trying to drive off DMS there, and you 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 don't really need the physical movement of the grain in the um, in the kettle. So just leave the lid on and just turn your flame down. And at that point, because also you you didn't make your decoction too thick, and you liquefied it beforehand, so it should just not scorch. Ah, well, there you go. And once the boil is, is over, just return the decoction to the main mash and stages uh, while you keep track of the temperature of the main mash. So just add a quart, stir it in, check temperature, or basically ch uh, check temperature while you're adding the decoction and stirring it in. And stop adding decoction when your target temperature is reached. So as we said, I, as I said before, you may have decoction left over because, because I asked you to add 10 to 20 percent. 
But that's intended because one problem that brewers oftentimes have is they undershoot the temperature. So they use one of the calculators or there are even formulas out there that consider the, the uh, different thicknesses of the decoction and in the main mash. And But it, it's all nice, but one thing that there are, there are a few things actually that these calculators don't take into account. That is the temperature drop that you actually have in the main mash and that's the evaporation that you possibly have in the decoction. So to compensate for that, just pull a larger decoction, add the decoction in stages, stop when you reach the temperature, and just return the remainder once it has cooled down a a little and is closer to the uh, current mash temperature. At that point, it won't really affect the mash temperature anymore. So... uh, uh, I'm forming some opinions here with this, this these beers as I go yeah. along. They may be completely wrong opinions, but I'm forming some opinions. So, um, so what are some some what are some mash schedules uh, that uh, that we can use? Because you can do a single deco- you you can just do one decoction if you want to. You can do yes. two. You can do three. Right. So the, the simplest form would be a simple de- a single decoction where you have some. Your single in infusion mash, you rest for 60 or, or just for, for 45 minutes. And after that time, you pull a thin mash and or a thin decoction mash. And then you boil that and return it to the main mash to get uh, to your mash out temperature. Other decoction mashes work well, too. And one thing to consider when choosing a, a mash schedule is that with today's malt, you want to minimize the protein degradation because decoctions tend to rest uh, the mash or the main mash a lot at lower temperatures, which are great for um, protein degradation, for beta glucan degradation. And that's something you want to minimize in order to, to not lose too much of the body of the beer. However, you have to keep in mind that this is only a really a concern for high enzyme malts. So if you are using a lot of Munich malts, um, for example, in your grist, there won't be a lot of protein degradation because the enzymes that are responsible for that, they have largely been, um, been killed during the killing process. So it is only really in, in uh, Pilsner malts and pale malts same Vienna probably that, that that you want to make sure that you minimize uh, the time the mash spends in the protein rest area, which is between hundred and uh, hundred and ten and hundred and forty degree Fahrenheit or forty five to uh, fifty five degree uh, Celsius. But don't be too afraid of the mash spending time. That uh, sometimes there it takes all it takes a while to just degrade enough proteins that it will show up as a thin beer. Mm. So two decoction mash pr- processes um, or the deco- decoction schedules that I commonly use are the decoction form of the Hochkurz mashes, which is uh, what they use for the Maybach where the dough in happens at about 60 degrees Celsius. The uh, first decoction is pulled uh, for 30 minutes. I would wait longer if I want to have a more fo- more fermentable word, and I would wait shorter if I want to have a less fo- fermentable word. And that decoction is brought to a boil over um, about 10 minutes, and then boiled for 10 to 45 minutes. It's then returned to the main mash to get to 70 degrees Celsius or 160 degree Fahrenheit, where it is rested for 30 to 45 minutes. If you don't want to rest that long, you just have to wait until the iodine re- reaction is negative. That is sufficient. Uh, there are some sources that claim that a long rest in the 70 degree Celsius range or 160 degree Fahrenheit range does promote um, head retention and it pro- promotes a fuller body hmm. of the beer. Hmm. That's interesting. So then after that, you uh, you do your decoction, your uh, mash-out decoction? Yeah, or, or, or you just uh, start, start a lot of it without a decoction. 
So the other mass schedule that I use a lot is uh, what I call the enhanced double decoction. And it's a great substitution for triple decoction. And I do use it for Doppelbock and Nelson beers. Here you would go in, just like with a triple decoction, you would go in at about 35 degrees Celsius or 95 degree Fahrenheit and rest for 20 to 30 minutes. So that, that allows the uh, maltohydrate and the enzymes to be um, be made solid. So that, and that allows for the enzymes to, uh, to just be dissolved into the mass liquid. And then you pull a really large decoction, about 55 to 65 percent of the main mash. Uh, and that actually works well by going into the kettle and then removing 45 to 35 percent percent of the thin mash that, that that's on top of that kettle. Hmm. Or that's in it. So basically you dough it into your in, in your decoction vessel and then remove what you want to keep in a cooler on the side. You heat this decoction to 70 to 75 degrees Celsius and hold it there for 20 minutes to give it some conversion. And then, so, then just proceed to bring it to a boil and boil it for 15 to even 45 minutes. And again, that, that boil can be done with the lid on, on the pot. And I'm, I'm actually able to do other chores around the house while that is boiling or basically it's just barely simmering hmm. in my case. That decoction is then returned to the main mash in stages to reach a temperature of about 67 degrees Celsius or 153, de 153 degree Fahrenheit. You can play around with that temperature to get a more or less fermentable word. Rest it there for 45 minutes and then either start your louder or do a mash out decoction to make it a double decoction. But then again, you can also go and do a classic triple or classic double decoction. Um, so the classic triple decoction I talked about earlier, a double decoction would just go in at protein rest temperature, which is about uh, 50 degrees Celsius or 122 degree Fahrenheit. But those are um, those uh, decoctions do uh, de degrade proteins more, and they should be reserved for less modified malts. So, so if you can get your hands on some old-fashioned, uh, less modified malts, in other words, in, in other words, <laughs> your beers are getting to me. In, <laughs> in, <laughs> in, in other words. Uh, malts that have been have spent less time in the germination phase, essentially. Uh, well, the recommendation is that if, if a malt has a soluble uh, protein ratio on SNR of less than thirty eight, it is uh, well suited for decoction mashing. But I have done a lot of decoction, especially with the two um, schedules that I just um, showed. And uh, those uh, malts, they, they were more modified up to like 42, 43%. Uh, per, percent. Hmm. So, and you, if you taste the beer, you wouldn't really think that this is a thin taste in beer, even though it's the cocktail mashed. Yeah, neither, neither one of these are, 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 are thin tasting beers. They're both, you know, they have good mouthfeel. They, uh, there are a couple of differences, which we'll talk in, talk about in just a second. Uh, but yes. is there another method that you want to talk about? Another mass schedule that you may want to consider, which is very similar to a decoction and should give you the same flavor profile, is what I would call a pseudo decoction. So where you dough in, convert, and boil about one half of the grain and one third of the water. So you just boil that for um, by say 20 to 30 minutes, then add the rest of the water and to get back to about 67 degrees Celsius. And at that point, you can then also add the grain back and just take it from there. So here, your main mash doesn't really exist. You didn't really take something out of a main mash. You just made one mash and you boiled that mash and then you added in fresh grain and more, and more water to bring to, for one, 
bring down the temperature to conversion rest temperatures, and then through the uh, fresh grain, bring in enzymes that can convert the starches that were liberated during the boil. Ah, well, so. see, well, see, there's our concoction right there. It's the, <laughs> it's the opposite of the decoction. It is. <laughs> Uh, I'm amusing myself a little too much here. So, uh, uh, shall we? Shall we? T- shall we get my take on the uh, A and B? Okay. Sh- okay. Here we yes, go. Yes. Go ahead. Are you ready? Yes. Now, like I say, both beers are delicious. The A I feel is a little more kind of. They're both. It seems like to me very very similar in color, if not the same. Yes, they're about, the same. they're about the same color. I couldn't really tell the color difference. The flavor in A is, to me, a little um, darker, so to speak. Maybe a, maybe a tiny bit nuttier. Maybe. Uh, I'm hedging my bets because the, the differences are so, so subtle. And B is maybe a little sharper. And just, a t- I mean, just... We're talking about tiny differences mm-hmm. between these two. Go ahead. So, uh, it's a, uh, this is the moment of truth. So I'm gonna I'm gonna say I'm gonna guess A is the decoction. Uh no. No. Oh! <laughs> but I uh, I don't I don't blame you. I mean I have a hard time take uh, tasting a difference either. So is and... the is the sharpness that I'm tasting in B could that be tannins? That could be. So I did. I want. I do remember the initial tasting that I had, where I did note that B seemed to be a little bit more astringent than A. Yeah. But uh, when I then repeated uh, that with a uh, an experiment where I poured four of each, so I had eight samples randomly mixed them up and then tried to pick them apart again. I couldn't uh, do that. <laughs> so I couldn't take take tell, uh, take the tell tell the difference. Well, I feel better. But uh, yes, it's it's not so much that you suddenly would expect this big malt because of the decoction, because all this big malt profile, especially the, the malt profile you would get from a good double bock. That's actually a malt profile on aroma that is developed during aging, in my experience. So a young double bock would actually tastes fairly uneventful. Huh. But if you give give it some time, then it starts to develop these black fr- uh, these dark fruit no uh, dark fruit notes and this raisin raisiny ca- character. So if there are just a little teeny tiny differences between the beers, um easy I mean I guess it depends on the brewer then whether you know decoction is worth the time and effort. One thing to consider when we talk about decoction in German beers is that decoction is not the secret to that typical German flavor. There's a lot of typical German beers that have this flavor which are not decocted. And uh, if you, for example, look at the aromas that associated with decoction, this big malt profile and all that, that you, for example, would get from a double bock, you can also get that big malt profile uh, without a decoction because it is largely a, a an aroma and, and a taste that is developed in the aging process. And if you just taste a fresh double bock that is just about, about a month or two months old, it tastes very uneventful. But once it is about six months old, you get these dark fruit notes that you want. And that doesn't really depend on decoction or not decoction. Well, I tell you one thing that decoction can give you uh, that infusion mashing uh, can't is the smell of grain cooking on your stove in your house. (laughs) Yes, that certainly is a lovely smell. (laughs) So for no other reason uh, than to to stand over your stove or do chores in your house while while the grain is cooking, to smell that smell uh, is a wonderful thing that everybody should experience at least once. Well, Kai, this has been fun, and I and I'm so thrilled to uh, finally be uh, uh, trying some of your uh, beers, and and there, there's more uh, waiting in the fridge. So I look. Yes, forward I think to I sent you a double box. So that one, uh, maybe you just give it another 
uh, three months or so, just put it in the back of the fridge. Oh, that's not fair. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you, you can have you can have it uh, not, not, now too. I just feel that uh, this beer really does so so much better if it's just half a year old to to uh, a year old. Okay, I'll be patient. <laughs> that'll be that'll be my beer to celebrate the end of summer. How about that? Yeah, that's a good celebration. Well, thanks, Kai. Oh, well, thanks for for having me again. Well, thanks again to Kai. Great information and delicious beers once again. Uh, I look forward to meeting Kai in person next month in Minneapolis, and I hope that uh, I get to see you too. Steve and I will be up there. We'll be uh, presenting. We'll be recording a show uh, up there on Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening, I guess you'd say, 4 o'clock. So uh, join us, and uh, I'll buy you a beer in the hospitality suite. How about that? <laughs> Until then, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Our 2010 Brewers logbooks are still available. We've got our new Ryan Heitzka boat is a four-letter word shirt on our shop as well. You can check out our home brewing DVDs, Introduction to Extract Home Brewing, Stepping into All Grain, Low Tech Lagering and Decoction Mashing, and Introduction to Wine Kits as well. And we've got combo deals to save you a few bucks if you want to buy more than one DVD at a time. You can see a listing of the fine folks across the country who sell our DVDs on basicbrewing.com. And if there isn't a vendor in your area, you can order them online in our online shop at basicbrewingshop.com. Thanks to everybody who's continuing to click on our Amazon.com link. We appreciate the support there. Our featured products this week that were purchased through the link are Cordials from Your Kitchen, Easy, Elegant Liqueurs You Can Make and Give, and Mosquito Czar, Mosquito Barrier, Natural Organic Mosquito Control and Repellent use one of those. Thanks again, everybody. Remember, I can't tell who bought what, so no worries there. Just click on the Amazon.com logo on our site the next time you feel like Amazon shopping. We appreciate your support. Don't forget, we have the associate links to the American Home Brewers Association and Brew Your Own Magazine on the site, too. That's all until next week. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio is provided by Kelly Dotson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. We'll talk to you next time, everybody. So long.